So now that we can quantify radiation, we need to actually see what it will do to a person. And remember, we have uh, the unit of a sievert, because that's a lot of radiation. We also have the unit of a millirem, but the chart I'm about to show you is in sieverts. So let's just put up the little conversion on the side so that you're ready for it as we come along. So we want to look at health effects of radiation. There's a really convenient chart. This chart is going to compare lots of different radiation doses and what their effects are. So let's zoom in to the top left corner. Sleeping next to somebody. Why is it dangerous? Well, there could be lots of reasons, but from a radiation point of view, it's not. Do you get dose? Sure. Some of the gamma rays from their potassium get you. 0.05 microsieverts. Not much at all. Living next to a nuclear power plant for a year. Tiny amount of dose. Why? Because nuclear power plants emit no radiation. Okay? Eating a banana. 0.1 microsieverts, a hundredth of a millirem. Bananas are loaded with potassium. They're good for you. Don't despair just because there is a noticeable or at least measurable radiation dose. Living next to a coal power plant. Why would you get radiation dose from a coal power plant? Well, remember, inside coal is just about everything, including probably a little uranium and thorium. It goes up in the smoke. An x-ray. So finally, you get your arm x-rayed. It's a microsievert. A microsievert is a tenth of a millirem, and that's what you get. Or if you use a CRT, the old-fashioned television, the kind that's actually wide, or a computer screen, use that for a year. You get a whole tenth of a millirem. Nothing whatsoever to worry about. Your natural dose is a millirem a day, just from nature. So, the last one on here is spending an extra day at some place that's in higher elevation. I talked about living in Colorado. 1.2 microsieverts a day that will add up to something like this 40, 50 micro uh, millirem extra per year just because you have less atmosphere protecting you from the cosmic rays. Let's go to a little bit higher levels of dose. A dental x-ray, half of a millirem. Your normal background dose, about one millirem per day. And then here at the bottom is if you fly on an airplane. You go across the U.S. from New York to L.A., that's six hours up in the air. You're at 33,000 feet. Remember, Denver was giving you extra millirem because it was at 1,000 feet. Now you're five miles up much less shielding from the cosmic rays from outer space, and you get a whole four millirems from flying across the country. Don't panic. Much more dangerous is the part about the plane maybe not landing. The four millirems, nothing to worry about. Let's look a little further. Now we'll take all those blue charts and they will turn into be just one of these green ones. You see an x-ray of your chest is 20 microsieverts, about 2 millirem. And if you actually were in Tokyo during the Fukushima accident, you may have at most gotten an extra 4 millirem, about the same as flying across the country once. If you live in a stone building, hey, uranium thorium in the stone, that's part of that natural background, that's at least just an extra 7 millirem a year compared to a wood building. Three Mile Island, the worst nuclear accident in the U.S., tiny amounts of dose within 10 miles, 8 millirem. We keep going down here, we get the amount that you might have been in the Fukushima Town Hall, and here is the amount that EPA says you could get from a nuclear reactor. Of course, you do get much, much less than that. This is the potassium in your body, and this is what you get from a mammogram. A mammogram, of course, can be extremely important because it can detect breast cancer early just because you get a whole 40 millirems from it is nothing to worry about.
compared to the potassium in your body or the mammogram, this is the amount of radiation that you're allowed to get for the public. 100 millirems extra per year. Here is the amount of dose that anyone possibly could have gotten from Three Mile Island, equal to the normal public safety limit of 100 millirems per year. Here we have the same thing if you were about two weeks right at the edge of the exclusion zone. And a CT scan of your head, two millisieverts, that's 200 millirem, about equal to the amount of radon exposure on average for a given year. And finally, here is that somewhere around 320 or so millirems, in this case they say 400 millirems, from a normal yearly background dose. So all of these things we've talked about, Fukushima, uh, Three Mile Island, act medical procedures, these are all still much smaller than the normal background dose you get in a year. No health effects at this point. All right, so let's go back to the power plant. That's how much the EPA says they want. Of course, power plants usually do much less than that. Here is Chernobyl for an hour. The scale between the radiation exposure at Fukushima and Chernobyl are not even comparable. Chernobyl was a complete, unmitigated disaster in terms of radiation and radioactive substances. This, for an hour at Chernobyl in 2010, many years later, compares to, say, one CT scan, a whole 700 millirems of radiation. Still, though, these numbers are below the limit imposed for workers who work in radiation. In fact, it's a lot larger than this looks. Let's go ahead and blow that up to the full size. The limit for a radiation worker in the United States, and this is uniform across the world, is 5 rem per year, all right? 50 millisieverts. Now, they actually limit it per quarter, so you can't like, hey, last day of the year I get my 5 rem, the next day I get my whole next 5 rem. They say 1.25 per calendar quarter. But you still see we haven't talked about health effects. That be is because that even if you're a worker and you get 5 rem and you go to the doctor and say, doctor, doctor, I think I've, I've hit my limit for exposure as a radiation worker. Test me, test me. I want to see, see how sick I've become. They can't tell. This chart, right up here, this is the 5 rem. This is the dose per a radiation worker in normal situations. Of course, if you have to go save property or if you have to go save lives, those dose limits can go up. Here are the limits for property. Here's the limits to save people. And interestingly, this amount was the amount the radiation workers at Fukushima got. This is medically noticeable. The first health effect of radiation we have here, the first detectable changes in your blood happen at 10 rem. This chart right here. 10 rem. There you can see some changes in your blood cells, some potential that you may someday get cancer at a higher rate than somebody else who's not been exposed. The health effects multiply pretty quickly by here. If you get 10 rem, you do not feel sick. In fact, if you didn't have a blood test, you'd never even know. If you get four times that, if you get 40 rem, you can start having radiation sickness, hair loss, redness, nausea. And if you go up here to 2 sieverts, which is 200 rem, you're definitely in this range of radiation sickness and radiation poisoning. You're going to need medical care. There's an a interesting number called the LD5030. Sounds like a motor oil. But it's the lethal dose for 50% of the population to die in 30 days. That's the number down here. Four sieverts, 400 rem. And if you get 800 rem, even with medical care, not instantly, but you are likely 
very likely to die. Those are the medical effects of radiation. Until you get to this 10 rem level, there is not a noticeable effect to your body in an acute dose. The worst nuclear disaster, of course, ever was at Chernobyl. And if we take that entire chart and we turn it into one of these yellow boxes, this was 10 minutes next to the core after the meltdown or an explosion. Nothing comparable to the radiation loss in doses at Fukushima. So what we've been talking about are acute doses, doses you get all at once. There's always the question about cancer. What type of dose do you need that would increase your chance of getting cancer? Let's talk about that next. At what radiation dose level do you start having an increased risk of having cancer? Clearly we know it's not in the tens of millirem. People in Denver are not dying faster of cancer than people of the same economic social class in New York City. But if you were having hundreds of REM, in many cases, we have documented cases where the people that were exposed, the people who were exposed at Chernobyl, have uh, documented how much exposure, and there are certainly increases in cancers in cer certain types of cancers and in certain populations. So, Taking not intentional disasters, but accidental disasters that happen over time, you can draw a chart where you have excess deaths. I'll get back to what I mean by excess deaths versus radiation dose. Now, what is an excess death? It's unfortunate, but Everybody dies, eventually. One out of four, approximately, will die of cancer. That doesn't mean they were all exposed to radiation. It's just you die of something. You'd love to be able to say, oh, I died of old age. Chances are, though, something wore out. Something went on a rampant growth streak. Something happens. So you have to compare populations and say, the number of people that should have died of cancer was this, but hey, there were actually more than that number. There were excess deaths that happened earlier. And maybe that's because that population had some sort of chemical, some carcinogen in their environment. Or maybe it's because they had a radiation dose. If you take these cases, you can make some cases, Chernobyl, Hiroshima, some other things, and you can put data points, and there's air bars on them, right? And you can draw these. And then you notice that this is linear. Okay? And it goes through zero and you get some chart. And you can take a slope from this chart. And this is called the linear hypothesis. And it says that any amount of excess dose is going to give you cancers at an excess number. And if I take the slope of this line, the convenient unit of that slope is 200 times 10 to the minus 6, that's 200 per million, excess deaths, excess deaths per rem of radiation per year. All right, so the slope of this line is this 200 times 10 to the minus 6, excess deaths per rem per year. What does that mean? Well, let's say we have here um, the number of people. Okay. And here is the dose they each get. So if I had 500 people each getting 10 rem, I multiply 500 times 200 times 10 to the minus 6 times 10. And by the way, that number turns out to be 1. So this will be a chart here of what it takes to make 1 excess death from cancer. So you get exposed for 10 rem. This theory, based on data, will say that you have a 1 in 500th chance each year of developing a cancer that you would not have normally developed. One out of four people are going to develop cancer at some point during their lifetimes. But 
In this case, the extra radiation dose gives you an extra 1 out of 500 chance of getting it. Of course, this is linear, meaning that if there are 50 people, each getting 100 rem, 100 rem, you're certainly experiencing radiation sickness, you will have a chance of 1 out of 50 of developing an excess cancer every year. It goes the other direction too, right? I could say this is 5,000 people each getting 1 rem. Of those 5,000 people, one person is likely to die from cancer from this excess radiation. Maybe. Let's go a little further. What if it was 50,000 people each getting 100 millirem? Or 500,000 people each getting 10 millirem? Remember, when we're at this scale of 10 extra millirem, this is like living at a little bit higher elevation of a couple thousand feet above sea level. And we don't have statistical evidence that says these small levels of dose follow this. In fact, the data we have says these small levels of dose actually don't give you excess deaths and excess cancers. The curve doesn't look like this. It looks something like this, where there is a threshold. Exactly what the threshold is, we don't know, but we do know we can see biological effects at 10 rem. Maybe at 1 rem, there still is some excess cancer. But certainly in these lower levels, the 100 millirem, the 10 millirem, the 1 millirem, 5 million people exposed to it, will one of those develop cancer that would not Otherwise, I think the answer here is clearly not. This is the difference between the threshold and the linear theory of radiation exposure. The data supports the threshold theory. And there's probably good reason for that from an evolutionary point of view. That one millirem a day that everybody gets from natural causes, that's been happening since the Earth was here. All of the evolution of life has been exposed to that. And that level of radiation exposure, our bodies are equipped to make certain repairs. Probably not just from radiation damage, but maybe from other carcinogens in our environment as well. There have been some very famous examples of radiation exposure. And one of the most interesting stories is the women in World War II who were painting radium dial watches. I actually have one of those watches, as you can see here. And this watch has very fine lines printed on the second hands. And it was using radium paint. Why? Well, radium glows. Radium is radioactive. The alphas and betas coming out of it, if you put a little phosphorus essence with it, will actually create light. In the 1940s, we didn't have fancy little LED lights or other types of liquid crystals with a nice visual display. If you wanted to see what time it was, you needed to turn a light on or have a radium dial watch. Why do you need to see what time it is in the dark? Well, let's say you were going on a bombing run over Germany, taking off from the United Kingdom. Bombing was very imprecise. There's no GPS. There's no laser-guided bombs. You want to basically know, am I over the industrial section of that city so I can bomb the factories that are making tank parts? If I try to find that city, I'm going to do it by I fly at this range for this length of time, at this speed. You look at your speed, you look at your compass, you look at it, you very precisely time, and then you know that you are going to hopefully be over your target. So you've got to know time to a very precise degree. To measure that time to a precise degree, if you suddenly turn on the light in your cockpit, all of a sudden the anti-aircraft gunners down on the ground are going to look up and they'll see, oh look, there's an airplane. They can probably hear it. They don't know where it is, where to shoot. As soon as you turn a light on, you're advertising where you are and you get shot down. So you needed to have a timepiece you could read in the dark. 
and that's where radium paint came in. So the U.S. Allied bomber pilots needed a radium dial watch. Well, how do you make it? There are no fancy laser engraving tools or wonderful assembly lines. What you do is you get somebody to paint it. It has to be a very steady, fine hand. And you need to have your paintbrush come to a very fine tip. Best way to do that, put the paintbrush tip in your mouth. Dip it into the radium paint and then very carefully go over each second hand. Pretty soon the tip of your paintbrush starts getting dull, so it goes back into your mouth to make the tip sharp again, back into the paint, and back on the watch. These were the radium girls. These were the people whose job was to paint these watches. There are records, how many watches someone produced, or at least how many hours they worked in the factory, how many months they worked in the factory. There is, of course, the ability to kind of do a model to figure out every time someone, how often would they put the mouth, brush in their mouth, how much radium did they likely ingest, therefore what type of dose did they receive. And indeed, the women who did this the most, not all of them, but the ones who did it the most hours had a higher incidence of getting cancer. In fact, some of those initial cancers were cancers of the mouth and of the esophagus itself because that's where the most of the dose, that's where the radian was first concentrated. My grandfather was a dentist. Well, more than that, he was a, back then in the 1920s, it was a dentist, an orthodontist, an oral surgeon. And x-ray machines were available, and x-rays for teeth are extremely important, right? You have to be able to see where the root of the tooth is and what the problem is. There was no lead curtains over people. There were no fancy holders, right? He would hold the x-ray film in the person's mouth, right, while he's holding the film in there. I remember my grandfather extremely fondly, wonderful man. And it was always interesting that you never actually did the game pull my finger because it might come off. <laughs> A little gross, sorry about that, but he did have kind of a constant festering bit of a store and final falling off flesh on his one finger, the finger he held the film with for all of those years for the radiation exposure. He did not die of cancer, he died of a stroke, fairly low old age, especially for the time, but this ability of saying, hey, the radiation goes through my finger, I can get a much larger dose. There are no critical organs in your finger. The same thing in your mouth and teeth, of course. They could end up getting some cancer of the mouth or the esophagus. Of course, as you ingest it and that radium goes through you, you can have some systemic cancer from your whole body. Not all the people by any means got cancer, but it's one of those data points on the linear hypothesis. Understanding the health effects of radiation is very important because you don't want to just be in fear of someone saying, it's radioactive. After all, you're radioactive and almost everything around you is too. What you have to be able to do is quantify it and be able to say how radioactive. How does it compare to background? How does it compare to the point where my body could repair the damage I'd have from that? That's what you need to know about radiation exposure.